Yeah. So my name is Nicola. I work at Spotify. Um, what I do there uh, is music information retrieval, which pretty much means uh, applying um, machine learning techniques to audio recordings and audio content in particular. So of course, I'm going to talk to you about uh, deep learning, what we have been doing lately at Spotify. Um, I just want to give you some context before we start. So I actually joined the Econest uh, originally, which is a company based in Boston, which does uh, what we call music intelligence as a platform. So we would focus on two main aspects of music. One is the cultural aspect. Uh, that means crawling the web and figuring out by analyzing text what people think of artists, which artists are related, and figure out all this stuff about music. And the other side, which was the one I actually work on, is the acoustic facet of music, which means training machines to learn if a piece of music is acoustic or um, instrumental, if it is happy or sad, energetic, danceable, all these characteristics. And we were bought by Spotify uh, last March. My guess is that one of the main reasons is because what we were doing in terms of, in terms, <coughs> sorry, of machine learning was kind of orthogonal to what they were doing, which was, which was basically um, collaborative filtering approaches. So one of the um, themes that I hope will emerge in this talk is trying to bridge these two approaches because they are complementary in a sense. So this brings me directly to the first point I'm going to talk to you today, which is can we use the information that we learn from collaborative filtering and the latent dimension and use that as training data for a deep learning system from audio content? And after that, can we reuse this kind of information that we learn uh, to other and apply it to other tasks? One of that is uh, predicting genre of uh, music, uh, of a track. And the other is, can we figure out which are the outliers and the ambiguous artists in our catalog? So let's jump right in. There's a lot of stuff I want to go, up, to go over. Uh, this is actually, I want to say, not my own work. It was done by Sander Dieleman. He's a PhD student soon to graduate from Ghent in Belgium. He was with us in New York doing an internship last summer. He did an amazing job um, and kind of converted a lot of people there to deep learning. So um, the point uh, from which we should start is, well, of course, Spotify has a lot of data, huge catalog, millions and millions of users. What's of interest, I guess, the most is that we log a lot of data just tracking user behavior. So we know what you play, uh, what time of the day, or you know, from which device, all this sort of stuff. And this is, of course, great data for collaborative filtering approaches. Um, and that's what has been done. But um, as you will know, collaborative filtering has lots of problems. Um, Rare items have you know, um, trouble bubbling up in a recommendation system. Um, it's called a co-star problem. And that's especially terrible for music. Um, people are already very accustomed to uh, liking what they already know. Uh, record labels are pushing certain artists. So can we uh, level the playing field in a way and allow artists which are more um, unknown to uh, become popular based on their acoustic merit? So that was. Uh, Sanders, um, sorry. Sanders' idea was mainly uh, to say, well, we have a huge source of data that we are not yet using. And that's what's hidden in our latent variables in our collaborative filtering models. So let's take a collaborative filtering approach. We have a giant matrix of uh, users and songs and entries that matrix is uh, positive when it's basically the number of track counts of, sorry, of track plays by a user. When we factorize this and we look at the song factors, well, that's extremely good training data, for example, for other tasks. And Sander's job was to train a neural network to go from um, audio content, so that means really spectrograms and FFTs computing on, on audio tracks, and try to predict these collaborative filtering variables. Um, it's a pretty standard convolutional neural network architecture. I don't really want to go into the details, but I'll give you guys some pointers where you can read about this in detail. Um, what I think was one of the most interesting outcomes was uh, analyzing what the network does and what does it actually learn. So first thing you do is, of course, well, what are um, the songs that most activate some specific neurons? Uh, and if you look at the convolutional layers, which are like the very first, 
the hypothesis that they should learn very local characteristics of the signal. And that's actually the case. For example, um, there should be music playing now. Uh, there should be some music playing, maybe. Female voice singing with a vibrato tone. Other neurons, uh, for example. Rock and the sugar don't stop. Gonna bring a bottle to the bay. Somebody sing that. Somebody sing that. So the network even learns to kind of separate these two concepts. Let's go on the other hand of the network. Uh, the higher levels of the architecture are supposed to learn more broader concepts, and that's that turns out to be true. Uh, in a way, they learn the concept of genre. And for example, uh, characteristic of the network that's useful for other tasks is that in this uh, latent space of the final layer of the network, uh, tracks that are close to each other in a uh, Euclidean sense tend to, thought, to sound a lot like each other, which means that this makes great features for other tasks. And one such task, for example, I've been working on that for the past month or so, is can we predict the genre of a track? Um, it's, to be fair, a very common task in music IR for the past 10, 15 years. But as usual, uh, what differentiates uh, the industry from academia is the massively different scale of the problem. Uh, usually you read about papers classifying tens of thousands of tracks into 25 genres. Here we have 13 other genres. There are 50 genres only for metal, for different various uh, variants of metal. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, local characteristical stuff for various countries. Um, and more important than that, our training data is not as clean. Uh, we have training data labels for uh, genre at the artist level, but not at the track level, because that would be too expensive to compute. So in the end, the big problem is really the data. Um, if we look at how many artists each genre has, um, that's not that terrible, at least from this graph. If you're wondering, the scale is linear. Um, you see a lot of Christmas in there, because this data was snapshot at the beginning of January. It would look very different if it was taken in November. But um, kind of a curiosity, but uh, this data constantly evolves, of course, and the problem arises when we uh, when we propagate when we propagate the the <coughs> the labels from artist level to track level, and we have several orders of magnitude of difference in this case. So, how do we deal with this? Um, well, the solution was to get a very simple model, actually. Uh, it's a very small network, trains really fast. Uh, we can iterate quickly because some genes get out or are removed. Uh, we tried larger networks, uh, more units, more uh, layers in the middle. That worked in the sense that we were getting lower error scores, but we were looking at the prediction and they didn't make sense. And of course, uh, we had to expect that in a way because we can just um, put uh, bad training data in there and expect it to be magical. So what we had to play with was um, what are the characteristics of the data that we have that we can go around in order to provide a, a loss function that can actually make, you, make use of this data. So we tried all the usual suspects. And in the end, we, did try, we ended up defining our own loss function, which looks kind of weird. But um, so we only penalize, for example, if you are not predicting some label that you're um, expected to predict. So um, we don't give you a penalty, for example, if you um, predict that the track is death metal if the label is not in there. But for example, there might be brutal death metal. There are so many variations that we don't really want to be too specific. And at the same time, we have to regularize this function. Otherwise, we could be predicting everything every time. So the idea was, well, let's try to match the norms of the predictive vector and the uh, label vector. That really started to work well. Uh, what was weird for me, at least at the beginning, was that fixing a constant uh, instead of the 
vector norm uh, actually work better. And if you think about that, there are artists with incredibly different output in terms of genres. So uh, propagating all these labels down to the track level means that you are assigning too many um, irrelevant genres to some tracks. And this way, you're forcing the network to only learn the genres that are specific always to um, particular to um, specific tracks. At least that's the interpretation that we came up with. Um, I want to show you some uh, quick demos. So this is uh, one of the many prototypes that radio guys keep uh, turning up. It's based on both uh, your taste, but also divided by genre. So for example, you would have a classical radio station, a pop radio station, a jazz radio station. And this is my jazz radio station. So you would expect it. So you see, all the, uh, all the artists make sense, uh, Dexter Gordon, Oscar Peterson, Herbie Hancock. What's the problem? Well, what you're looking at is actually, I scored the, my, all the tracks in my radio and divided by scores on the left and high scores on the right for jazz. What you see is, for example, you find artists, Herbie Hancock did incredibly different stuff during his career. Rocket is not what you would want. <laughs> You'll find Herbie Hancock playing uh, the, the roles in the background uh, for a more pop sounding song. It's a popular Duke Ellington tune. So you would expect to hear, you know, Brahms and Mozart and all the usual suspects. And then you find on the bad playlist, uh, Bartok and Barber and Schubert, all these guys which should be fine. And then you listen to it and you say... <laughs> There was supposed to be Schubert after that, but again. So it's not a metadata problem. Sorry, it's not a genre problem, it's a metadata problem. And this is, of course, um, badly uh, matched artist. Which brings us to our. Okay. Right. Brings us to our last point. Uh, can we spot the flyers in our catalog? Um, on the left, you see Charlie Chaplin. He's in there because not only he made movies, but also the music for his movies. On the right is also Charlie Chaplin. So apparently you find out that in the 70s, uh, reggae artists named themselves after movie stars, which is great if you have to Google for it. Um, can we spot which is which from the audio? Well, again, we use the same trick as before. We look at the final um, layer in the neural network, and artists which are ambiguous like this clearly um, um, cluster in two very different parts of the space. And we have also the reverse problem, which is called the, the duplication. So maybe you have Wagner and Richard Wagner, and they are the same, but they were, for some reason, with two artists at the end, you want to bring them together. So this is all stuff which is already being done with collaborative uh, filtering vectors to um, suggest to metadata curator what to look at first. Uh, and what we're doing right now is trying to integrate, again, another source of information to make this um, process more reliable and, in the end, fixing metadata errors much more quickly. So this is how you find, for example, Charlie Chaplin. You find a lot of other artists. There's all sorts of stuff in the catalog. Uh, even found Beethoven played by Animal Ringtones. It's amazing. Um, I just want to stop now. I want to leave you uh, with a couple of pointers. First is all the details you might want to read about uh, Sanders' work. So 
if you want to learn about piano and convolutions and layers, like all the details about his work are in there. <coughs> uh, another presentation by Eric Bernardson, who pretty much uh, built up the whole machine learning infrastructure at, and team at Spotify on how we do uh, machine learning, how different models are combined together, um, and how we do recommendations. And finally, I also stole a few maps of the genres by uh, Glenn McDonald. Uh, he's responsible for everything genre at the Econet. So I'll stop here. I'm really happy to take any questions, and thanks for listening.